And if you watch the film as like a, um, you know, a kind of a, a creation myth, then you'll see somebody who had difficulty uh, having kind of what we think of as traditional social interactions, and so kind of put it online in a way that's all quantifiable. So if you like this music, I also like this music, and therefore we're friends, which is a kind of rudimentary and unnuanced way to think about, or like parallel nuanced way to think about human interaction. So I'm not on any of these things because I feel like it distances us from, from those interactions, which may, I'm not, I don't have a superior position, but it's m much more comfortable for me to see a person and know if they're holding a knife. <laughs> <laughs> In a movie like The Social Network like this, like I have such a great sympathy for that character on the page, and this is not obviously a fault of Aaron Sorkin, who's the greatest movie writer in the world, but it's just, you know, it's an actor's job to bring the kind of emotional life to that character. You know, it's the cliche of the villain in the movie thinking they're the hero. Uh, and so, like, in the Batman movie, I play a villain, but, you know, I think of it in the most sympathetic of terms because there's no other way to really play it. I mean, you can't play the idea of a mean person because mm -hmm. no mean person thinks I'm being mean. No, they think I'm, I'm right. And if I'm being mean, it's a tactic to get this other thing, which is righteous. If, you would, if you'd been an actor in the 1950s, you'd have to be a cowboy. That's true, but if I was an actor in the 70s, I'd probably be uh, some kind of sexual god because uh, it was like Elliot Gould. I mean, I, yeah. I, 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 could, I could sleep with the people he's sleeping with. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, I, yes, the 50s would have been terrible for me. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Woody Allen kind of pioneered the idea of somebody that looks like us kissing a woman and the audience not kind of cackling. Um, uh, or that the expectation wouldn't be a laugh. Maybe we're, it's a sign of our times that we're losing the capacity to really communicate. I mean, maybe voicemail answering machines years ago started that thing too, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. No, I recognize my own kind of critical uh, view of this as entirely out of my own fear of it rather than some kind of, you know, kind of rational and, and perfectly thought, thought out. Uh, idea, because I use a telephone without complaining about it, and I'm, I'm sure my grandparents' generation complained, you know, it's the illusion of a relationship, it's the surface of the accomplishment of the relationship during their <laughs> talks at NYU. Um, <laughs> I don't know where it's changed, where a cop gets out of his car and shoots a 12-year-old boy with a toy gun. They say, well, it looked real. Well, why did you jump out of your car and shoot the kid? Why didn't you take cover? Uh, I mean, today, it's like gangbusters. You know, one clip after another, as in Amadou Diallo, uh, and it's the cover-up. And the society is not blind. They know what's going on. It's the police that have to realize that they're not immune to prosecution, and they're going to be held to task for their actions. Do you think that... Uh that there's still a sort of widespread or even a small lack of confidence in our institutions, both the DA's office, the police department. We are going through a intense period of public questioning about law enforcement, both police and prosecutors. This to me, however, is not something to be afraid of. This actually, I think, is one of those periods that's a big opportunity the problem is in not asking the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's the biggest problem. And I think if the public starts to see that its law enforcement agencies are actually acting on public concern, maybe not perfectly, but they're, they're owning it and they're trying to find their way through it, I think over, the, over time that will restore public confidence. The problem is the, the good officers, and this is what I've gotten out of everything, the bottom line from every state, Every time, no matter who they go to, um, the word is always, we can't do that because it, it would undermine the public's uh, confidence in the police. Who are you talking to here? That, that's already been undermined. So the point is that when good men or women come forth, they ha there has to be somebody who's going to take action and not look the other way. I happen to go to Wall Street 25 years after the book came out. You would not recognize the place. There's nobody standing up and shouting. And all of the 
uh, the, the great masses of the universe are now little clerks behind a, a bank of computers. And if they have anything to say, they have to say it on, uh, uh, they, they have to tweet it. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's about it. That, that's, I think, a, a, a huge change. And there's something not understandable to average people about how a guy who's got a, literally a billion dollars <clears throat> um, and is living a nice life, why they would risk separation from their liberty and free air for a few million dollars more. And I don't know the answer to that question, but it happens, and it happens all the time, and that's why we're as busy as we are. You know, I think everybody, no matter what station they may be at, it, <clears throat> uh, looking at it objectively, is part of a, what I call a status fair. And you can be just as, as anxious <clears throat> and t uh, torn apart by the fact that someone's making 10 million or five billion more than, uh, than you are, and you're, you're already very, very wealthy. And it happens the other way around, too. The, uh, uh, there are people who seem to be at the bottom who are part of a status fear that's very important to them. You know, writers seldom start off with the idea they're going to make money writing. They really don't. Uh, they think they're going to be famous. This and that's going to happen. It has nothing to do with money. It doesn't have anything to do with money until uh, you start seeing writers around you who are uh, making a lot of money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> until then, your motives are absolutely pure. When on a street corner, you see a guy kill a guy point blank with a gun, uh, other than, I guess, the possibility it was in self-defense, th the question of whether or not a crime has been committed is not really there. Whereas when you're talking about a financial crime, often you need not only prove, uh, and it can be difficult, that the person you've charged committed the crime, but that a crime was committed. And so most of the insider trading cases you see that we brought are about what by themselves would be the innocent purchases or sales of stock, but the story behind those purchases or sales become important to prove that the person knew that they were trading on insider information. Over 90% of sexual assault cases involve a person assaulting somebody that they knew. And that is at the root of a lot of the problems that relate to sexual assault as well with the tendency to blame the survivor for what happened. You know, it's like, oh, well, why were you walking outside late at night? As opposed to understanding the reality of the situation, which is, well, I went to a party with my friend and then this happened to me. Why should I have to fear my friends? Why should I have to fear people that my friends know? Why should I have to fear other students at my school? I think if somebody is walking through a, a dangerous neighborhood and they're assaulted, okay, maybe that was uh, a mistake in judgment, but that's still a crime and it's still uh, tried and, and approached in the same way. You're not, you don't say to that person, well, you know, you're somehow responsible. The reality is what this country has failed to deal with is sexual assault, both within college campuses and throughout society. Those are the real, that's the real problem here. It's, it's not the small percent of people who are falsely accused. It's a problem. I mean, it's always a problem if one person is, but let's, let's keep the focus on the real major problem. Are there other ways to say yes other than to say yes? So the California law actually says that it can be verbal or nonverbal. So that's one thing. Um, but of course, verbal is the best. That's what we try and emphasize is that we need a profound shift in how we look at sex. If the media were to show images of sex that weren't people slamming other people up against the wall, then we would have a completely different culture. And so hopefully one day we will actually have images of people asking for consent. I always say that if you're not sure whether you're having consensual sex with someone, you should ask them. The reality is in all those studies, the rapes are coming in, and the rapes and attempted rapes are coming in in the, in the 10 and closer to the 15% rate. So most of those sexual assaults in all the national studies, in, in nearly all the national studies, are very, very serious crimes. It's a very serious issue, but we still, there's something about society that wants to deny it. I think what the filmmakers wanted to do and what I've dealt with dealing with young Germans of my and subsequent generations is coming to terms with their own guilt, with their own historical guilt as to how could this have happened. I once had a dialogue 
in Bergen-Belsen with some young Germans, and one of them got up and said, you know, I wish that someday, my fondest wish is that one day I should be able to say, I'm proud to be a German, and I know that can never happen. The problem in the trials was that the judges were of a different ilk, an older generation. And so you'd read these indictments, which would be masterpieces of historical investigation and legal analysis, 200 pages laying out chapter and verse what was done in this camp or by this unit, by the Germans, how they're guilty, how there's no doubt about it. Then you'd read the judgments, and they would more or less parrot the indictments, and then they would say, and for this deed, they get three years in jail. One might get the impression from the end of the film that, well, the Auschwitz trial went forward, and, and after that, um, accountability was uh, a, a frequent occurrence in German legal proceedings when, when in fact, it wasn't. There were isolated uh, instances of trials, even important trials, but for the most part, uh, the vast majority of the perpetrators um, uh, living in Germany and elsewhere in Europe uh, got away with it. And as someone who uh, helped uh, in, a, in, a, in a Justice Department effort to, to secure some small measure of justice and, and get these people back to Europe where they had the uh, criminal jurisdiction that we lacked, that, that will always be a, a, a huge frustration.